This week we're concluding the series Going Green, and we're talking about coming from behind. And you know, no matter what is before us, no matter what circumstance we may be facing, we can be confident in the power of the Good Shepherd who is behind us. He gets us where we need to go. We hope this message blesses you. Enjoy. Been in a series, we're, we're ending it today called Going Green. And today we're talking about this aspect of coming from behind. Coming from behind. We love those kind of stories where somebody starts out really rough and they, they, they have this, this story to where, man, they overcame all the odds and they, they come out the winner. You know, we love those stories, right? Some of you have that story. Some of you are living that story even now, this aspect of coming from behind. And, and we can relate with that in different situations in our life, just coming from behind, overcoming great odds and, and, and heartaches and hardships in our life. This psalm that we have been in, this, the 23rd Psalm, it's a portion of scripture. It's one of the probably top five, top 10 scriptures in, uh, that, that are most well known. That, you know, John 3, 16 and 17 are probably the best known. And then you go from there and this is one of those. It only has six verses in it, one through six. And we've been in that and we're in this last part of the scripture. It's written by somebody who can relate with coming from behind. It was written by David. David, who ultimately became King David of Israel. We know his, his different aspects of his story and different times that, that we can focus in on. But ultimately, David was a shepherd boy. He was the baby in the family. Any babies in the family? Babies rule, just want you to know, right? I, I'm a baby in the family, and we're always right, right? Yeah. The older ones went, you don't even know exist on my radar with opinion, right? Babies. David was a baby. He was the baby of many brothers. So he had older brothers. We know the stories. He's out in the field and he's doing what a shepherd does, tending sheep. And he learned his livelihood and he learned his perspective and his experience is based upon the journey of a shepherd of which he writes about time and time again in one of those particular writings was the 23rd Psalm. David writes this, understanding what a shepherd does, understanding who the shepherd is, and the relationship with the sheep, and he puts that knowledge base to work. And today we're going to talk about this aspect of coming from behind because the writer of this Psalm, David, knew what it was to come from behind. He knew what it was to start out less than and to ultimately become a king. To ultimately become the highest position in his country. All from a shepherd boy. Now that's a come behind story. That's a coming from behind story. The scripture, the Lord is my shepherd. I won't lack anything. That's what it says. The Lord is my shepherd. And we've talked about this. And I want to review so that we can close it out today. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack for nothing. And it's a relational statement. Because if the Lord's not your shepherd, the reverse is true, then there's going to be a lot of things I'm going to lack. There's going to be a lot of things that if, if I don't have that, it's going to be detrimental to my life, my livelihood, my future, my destiny. The Lord is my shepherd, therefore I lack nothing. And if you're here this morning and you've made that declaration and that's, your, that's, that's that relationship that you could say with, with the Lord through Jesus Christ, he's my shepherd, then then you lack for nothing. It's not contingent on what I go through as we see in this scripture. Because if the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. And he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. We go down through this story and we go down through this passage of scripture. And we see where, yes, as the shepherd, that relationship I have. And he can make me do what I don't want to do, but I need to do. There's things in your life, my life at times, that we need to do it and we don't want to do it. We know that would be good to do, but we don't want to do it. We know we need to go down this path. That's the right path, but I don't like this path. We all understand that, but that shepherd, that relationship, we could trust him because he'll make me lie down in green pastures. He'll make me lie down where I need to lie down. He'll take me to a place where my soul can be restored. You may be here this morning and you're at that point in your life. You need something restored to you. Can I tell you, you can trust the shepherd for that? Amen. You can trust the shepherd for that. 
And though I walk, the, the scripture says, through that valley, through that dark valley, the shadow of death, I don't have to fear evil. I don't have to have... Can I tell you, he hasn't given us a spirit of fear, has he? He's given us a spirit of power, the word of God says, and of love and of a sound mind or of self-discipline. And so what I go through, we've talked about, is not that important, but it's how I go through it because of who I go through it with. We've talked about that over the weeks. And we have to remind ourselves because there are dark times that come. Can I tell you, if you look at the paper... If you watch the news, we live in a dark time. The world is messed up. And de depending on your opinion, you know, if we have 100, 150 people in here and we ask each one of you your opinion on politics, jihad, terrorism, refugees, uh, uh, how to vote, who to vote for, and all this, we would probably have 100, 150 different opinions, right? What if we went into the throne room of God and we go, God, what's your opinion? He'd go, I'm sorry, who are you? No. You know, at the end of the day, the only opinion that matters is his, right? Why? Because he's my shepherd. Whatever the shepherd says, I have to receive that. Now, in our westernized American culture, we go, well, that just doesn't seem fair. Because that means I don't have a right. Nope. You don't. When the shepherd says run, you run. When the shepherd says stop, you stop. When the shepherd says lie down, you lie down. You say, well, I don't like that. Deal with it. Not with me. I didn't write it. It's in the word of God. You've heard me say, and I'll say it again. If all you had was the Bible. If all you had was the Bible, it'd be enough. I mean, it's a great road guide. It's a great road map. It's a great uh, foundation to build your life on because everything you need is right there. If it's in the Bible, it's there for a reason, right? If it's not in the Bible, it's not there for a reason. The shepherd says, go. I said, okay. The shepherd says, jump. I said, okay. I don't even say how high. I just jump. I do my best. The shepherd says, that's not high enough. I say, but look at them, Lord. They're not jumping as high as me. That's kind of what we do sometimes, right? But Lord, I'd jump higher if they jumped higher. God, I would do that if they would do that. That's not following the shepherd. The shepherd can get us to where we need to go. And even if we feel like we're starting from behind, he can come behind us and he can encourage us. And we're going to see that in the scripture here in a moment. The Lord's my shepherd. I lack nothing. It makes me go where I need to go. It restores my soul. If I listen to the shepherd, if I trust the shepherd enough, even when I go through it, some of you going through it. So you've been through it. You've been there, done that. You got the t-shirt, got the tattoo. He can get you through. He'll be with you. He prepares a table where he puts us on display. We talked about this last week. You know, sometimes God's preparation and the table that he, that he puts us at and, and invites us to is not always to our liking because then we look across the table and we see who's there and the Bible says it. He prepares a table in the presence of my enemies. Lord, I don't want my enemies there. I just want you and me and, and let's just eat turkey together and be happy. God says, No. So I've got this table for you. I've prepared it. I'm putting your life on display. And this is something I'm going to do, not only through you, but in you. And it's something that's going to affect everything. Can I tell you, I believe that the brightest time, the strongest time, the most powerful time for the church, not just crosswalk, the church, the body of Christ, is upon us. The mandate is still the same. Jesus said, I've been given all authority in heaven and in earth. Therefore, go and preach this gospel in all the world. That tells me there's one of two things that can happen. You can either go to the world or the world can come to you. I want that to sit in for a second. I'm seeing a seed being planted in the heart of the church. Not just crosswalk, the church. That's a... That's, that's a seed of anxiety, that's a seed of fear, that's a seed that's cowering back. That how's this going to affect everything I've worked so hard to build? And so, Jesus said, I've been given authority, heaven and earth. Therefore, go to all the world, preach the gospel. He hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. And if that means that I have to love those that aren't loving, 
so be it. He prepared a table before us in the presence of our enemies. I'm not saying all the politics and all the things and all the decisions and everything, but I'm telling you this. If death, hell, and the grave comes to your doorstep, he's given you the power to overcome it. The gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. That's the power he's put in our hearts. The rest of you will come along. <laughs> so if you're here, and this, this, is, this is the whole point. Nothing political at all. It's very biblical. He has equipped his church with the power of the Holy Spirit, Acts 1.8, and you will receive power to be my witness. And then it goes out, time, 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 to the uttermost parts of the world. Can I tell you, whether we go to the world or the world comes to us, however it looks, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's not the gates of hell charging you. That's the church charging the gates of hell. And it will not prevail against it. And so if you're struggling with anxiety and fear and what's this world going to look like and what's it going to play out and how's it going to be, can I tell you, the church is fully equipped to take it on because we have a shepherd we can trust. And we have a powerful God who can speak life into death and he can make dead things rise. And there's some dead elements of the church and I believe God is going to breathe life into some people. He's going to call some people. He set them apart. Because here's the thing. He doesn't just bring you to the table in the presence of your enemies. What does he do? He anoints your head with oil. And it's so much so, it, it overflows. Where does it overflow to? I don't know. But it's evident that you got more than enough. Amen? I haven't even got into our scripture yet. Psalms 23.6 Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Check this out. Is the goodness and mercy ahead of me? Uh -uh. It's following me. It's coming from behind. It's empowering me. You know, when somebody's got an issue, they got a problem, sometimes you call your friend, you call your family, you talk to your spouse, you talk, talk to somebody, and, and you present the problem, and what do they say? Well, you've got this. You can do this. You could. What are we doing? We're encouraging, and encouragement is this thing that builds us, that pushes us, that, that drives us. You've got this. You and God got this. I'll tell people all the time. I'm like, you know what? You can't do it on your own, but you and God, you can do it. You can do anything with God. If he's my shepherd, and I've declared it, I lack nothing. Oh, the way may be dark, the road may be hard, there may be some obstacles, but if he's with me, and the scripture says he's with me, it's surely goodness and mercy. You know what goodness is? It's grace and mercy. Those two are very different. You need to understand that. I'm not sure which one, I, I want them both. I want grace in my life and I want mercy in my life. Mercy is this element of the bad that I deserve. And God holds it back. Grace is this element of good that I don't deserve that he gives me. So this idea of goodness and mercy is this element of grace and mercy following me all the days of my life. To put that in perspective, when I'm hitting that tough time and I don't know what to do, it's coming from behind. Get the picture of a shepherd and the sheep. Most of the time, the shepherd is driving the sheep, getting them where they need to go, stopping them where they need to stop. It's coming from behind. This idea of the scripture is, is the shepherd, goodness and mercy is following me all the days of my life. You got to see this. Notice, he leads us and his goodness comes from behind. It comes from behind. It's pushing us. It's, it's like a wave encouraging us prodding us on. You ever watched shepherd or, or any kind of animal that's a herd animal? You know, they're, they're out there. No, don't go here. Don't go here. Remember, the shepherd has a, has a staff and has a rod. He could correct. He's for the sheep, though. It's not like, oh, out of line, kill it. Uh-uh. Though that may be what you deserve, mercy comes into play. You know what? This sheep's in line, but boy, he's been a struggle. He's been ornery. You know what? But grace, you know what? Come here, you're doing okay. You're doing good. Grace and mercy following me all the days of my life. When I want to stop, when I don't like what I see, when it doesn't feel comfortable, the shepherd knows, nope, I got to get you there. I've got to get you there. You got to keep going, but I don't want to go. But mercy and grace is encouraging me. 
is powering me forward. But sometimes those animals get ornery, don't they? I remember years ago, I had the opportunity to go on a trail ride uh, with a gentleman in our church at that time. We had a, a, a production that we would do, a big drama that we would do called The Passion. And at one point, we had seven horses riding into the sanctuary, live horses. We had camels. We had sheep. We had a mess on the stage. We had all kinds of stuff. He goes, hey, you want to go on a trail ride? And he provided the horses and, and some of the other animals. And I said, uh, yeah, that'd be cool. And, and so I met him out, and we, we actually camped out, and his brother joined us, and, and they were up in their 60s. I think his brother might have been close to 70. And uh, so they, at, at that time, I'm in my early 30s. Actually, no, I'm in my late 20s. And, and we're going on this. So I'm the young guy and I'm inexperienced. I've ridden horses at that time, but not like they had. And we show up and there's two horses and a mule. And I'm like, oh, dear God, don't put me on the mule. I'm thinking that would just not be good. I, my, my grandfather always talked about how he had a team of mules when he was a young boy, and, and that's farming the hard way, let me tell you. And he would, he, would, he would farm behind these, and he said, don't kid yourself, Alan. He said, that mule, he lived his whole life just to kill you. Never trust him. And so that always stuck in my head. And I saw this mule, and you know, you'd kind of pet him and everything, but you went to walk behind him, and he'd try to kick at you. And I'm like, why would you even bring that thing? You know, you can't eat them, they're no good. I mean, you just, you know... Luckily, they put me on the horse. And we get going, and it's kind of fun. It's kind of cool trail ride. This is deep. And all of a sudden, that mule just decided that it should roll in the dirt. And the guy's riding it. His brother's riding it. Now, those of you that know about horses, you'll know about this. This mule is over 16 hands tall. He's a big, big mule. That's, that's tall. That's huge. He's riding along, and he's having to plow rein it. I mean, that's, that's how he's... And why they brought this thing along, I don't know. And this animal just decides. We are going good. We're going down the trail. It's happy. I like happy, don't you? It's scenic view. It's good weather. And all of a sudden, he just gets in his system. I should roll in the dirt. Literally, roll in the dirt. Many times. He's got a rider on him. That's the problem. He's got a saddle on him. And so he just lays down. Luckily, he got his leg out from under him, was able to dive to the side. And here this thing's coming. And he's trying to just keep pawing, trying to get away from this thing just starts rolling. I'm like, all right, shoot it. We're good. And they're like, oh, man, man, they're trying to grab it. And anyway, he jumps up. The saddle goes sideways. So now he's really not like a life. But he created it. Unfortunately, this sounds familiar to many of our stories, doesn't it? And then the first thing we do is go, God, why'd you put this saddle on me? And God's going, why'd you decide to roll in the dirt? We're chasing this thing on horseback. I'd almost get up to him. He's running. We're, we're riding through the woods now. This is not a pleasant trail. I didn't have a gun. I should have had a gun. Riding, riding. For an hour, we're trying to catch this very intelligent animal. <laughs> and he didn't realize they did have a gun back at the camper. Okay, spoiler story here. Yeah, they didn't kill him. They should have, though. Anyway, but they were talking about it. They're like, I can go get the gun. I can go get the gun. I'm like, go get the gun. I don't care. Finally, we got a hold of it. And I think of this story. And I think about, don't we do that sometimes? God's taken us along a trail. God's taken us along a path, this journey. And things all of a sudden don't turn out right. Or we get some kind of gumption in us that, well, I should do this. It messes everything up. But can I tell you? He leads us and his goodness comes from behind. And he gets us back on track. And he goes and gets us. He pulls us around, and he gets us where we need to go. And sometimes it's at those moments that we just need to stop. And I see a lot of people that get those moments, and God gets them back on a trail. He gets them back on the right path, and all of a sudden they go, okay, I got this. Let's just keep going. Let's just keep going full force, full force. And he goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. 
you need to lie down for a second. You need to chill out for a second. You need to calm down. You need to recalibrate. You need to reestablish the relationship with the shepherd here because something just went off track. You didn't trust me. You got your eyes on something else. You need to lie down. And that's that portion of scripture where it says he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters and he restores my soul. That's something you need to hear that this morning. You need to revisit that. And it's all relational with the shepherd. You got to trust that shepherd. Because when those times come that are dark and those times come when you're sitting at a table that you don't even want to be at, yet it's to your honor and it's to your benefit because of who's sitting there and the things you've dealt with. He comes from behind and he goes, you're going to be okay. Goodness and mercy, grace and mercy, follow me and keep me straight and keep me on path all the days of my life. And then it goes into this preparation to fulfill our destiny. He leads us. And his preparation fulfills our destiny. That last part of the scripture, surely your goodness and love follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's a promise here. It's a fulfillment. Meaning the shepherd's not just leading you down a path. He's leading you to a destination. And it's going to be with him. But you got to trust him. You got to trust him on that journey. You got to trust him on that meantime. You got to trust him on that path. When it doesn't look like something you would want to even go down. You can trust him. You can trust him. Dwell in the house of the Lord forever. How cool is that? Some of you are just struggling with. I don't even know this idea of destiny. I don't even know what God has for me. Can I tell you? It's something. I think of the scripture, Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plan to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and future. Remember, the shepherd is for you. He's for you. That's, that's critical on this journey. That's critical in this relationship. Because sometimes we interpret our relationship with the shepherd based upon what we can see. Let that sit in for a second. Based upon what I can see, if my relationship is based upon what I can see. You know, put it in a marriage context. People get married. And one of the key things in marriage, for better or for worse. For richer, for poorer. Till death do us part. It's part of a marriage. It's part of a covenant. That's part of this thing of saying, you know what? Though good times come, though bad times come, we're in this. My relationship with God is no different. But so many times we interpret our relationship with the shepherd as, this is a rough time. God, where'd you go? God goes, oh no. Even though you walk through the valley, the shadow of death, even though it's dark, I'll be with you. My rod and my staff, it comforts you. That rod and that staff, get back in line. Get back on the trail. You don't want to go down there. You don't want to do that. I've got a plan. I'm preparing your destiny. You want to know about destiny and what God has for your life? Read Psalms 139. Psalms 139, it talks about how he knows my thoughts. That's scary. Before one comes to be. Before anything comes out of my mouth, he knows what I'm about to say. Some of you are like, well, then I won't say it. can't hide from him, can't get away from him. Why? Because he's not for you? Uh -uh. He's totally for you. Is it because he's against you? No. Simply that rod, that staff, he's getting you back in line. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our destiny is to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If he's your shepherd, if that relationship is there, if that commitment, that understanding of no matter what I go through, it's not about what I go through. It's about who I go through it with. It's not about what I go through. It's how I go through it because of who I'm with. And he comes from behind and he goes, you're going to be okay. Come on, you got this. We got this. I came across a prayer in closing this morning. I came across a prayer. One of my friends on Facebook 
he travels the world. Literally, I was talking to him back a few years ago, and he had lost track of how many countries he had been in at 85. He works with Convoy of Hope. His name's Matt Wilkie. And Matt takes teams to different countries and, and all over. And he had posted this, and I, and I, and I read it. it. said a Franciscan prayer, and he said this, it messed with him. And so I read it, and then it messed with me. <laughs> and so it messed with me, so I brought it to our leadership team meeting Thursday night, and I wanted it to mess with them. I figured if I'm going to get messed with it, you should be messed with too. And so, and I read it, and where it messes with me is it, it makes me aware of just how selfish my prayers can be. Because so many times my prayers, like your prayers, can be, God, if you'll just take care of that, then that, that, that's, if you'll just make this problem go away, God, if you will just provide this, that would be good. God, if you will just take the darkness out of this trail, if you'll just make this journey just simple and easy, then I don't even need faith. And that's kind of how my prayers go, how your prayers can go. This challenges it. I want to read it to you. May God bless you with discomfort. Well, that's not an easy prayer. May God bless you with discomfort and easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, hunger, and war so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and to turn their pain to joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in the world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done to bring justice and kindness to all our children and the poor. Amen. When I read that, <laughs> I'm going through it and I'm like, Lord, that's not how I pray. That's not typically how I pray. God, just remove all discomfort. Make all things easy. And it's not necessarily that's a wrong prayer. But that's a prayer that goes contrary to a table that may have enemies before us. To be on display for his glory and his honor. To be used at his hand. All the while knowing that he's with me. How many times I pray a prayer for a life that if he wasn't with me, it wouldn't wouldn't matter. Can I tell you, our life should be different if the shepherd's with us or if the shepherd's not. But so many times we pray, God, give me this and this and this to the effect that he doesn't even need to be there. And can I tell you, he's a God that wants a relationship with his people. If it was about making us strong enough that we don't need a shepherd, then there's no relationship opportunity but oh, how he wants a relationship. And if you find yourself battling and, and wondering why life is this and this and this, and you feel alone and you feel, and maybe it's, you're not leaning in to the relationship aspect that you're designed to have with the shepherd. I'm gonna ask you to stand this morning. I'm gonna ask the prayer team to come and uh, they can pan out across here. And if you're here today, I truly believe, I said this at the beginning, I truly believe that now is the time for this church to shine in the world. Not just Crosswalk, the church, capital C stuff here, the church to shine in the world with its unity, with its compassion, with its power. We're not a powerless entity here. We have such a power that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So if you're here this morning, you're fighting some fear, maybe even some anger. This world is corrupt. This world, you know what? It is, and it needs a savior. And the mechanism by which that gospel goes forth is through you and me, the church. He's commissioned us. That mandate of that commission, the great commission has not changed. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Why? He's been given authority in heaven and in earth. And that same authority he puts upon his people, his followers, his sheep. He empowers.
empowers them to be on that path, that right path. And though I walk through the valley, the shadow of death, though it gets dark, he's with me. Amen? You can do this with him. You can get through this with him. You can get from where you are to where you need to be in him, by him, through him. We pray this message spoke to you today. And if there's any way that we can be praying for you, go to our website, crosswalkcc.com, fill out a prayer request form, and we will lift you up in prayer. And if you're in the Sioux Falls area, come and join us Sunday mornings at 9 or 1045 or Wednesday evenings at 630. Thanks. Have a blessed week.